Bill, we, uh, we have 15 minutes before the break, or 12 minutes before the break. Do you want us to do the cases? But I have a question for Dr. Lowry. 85-year-old patient with a ruptured cord, and you can repair it, or you could pop in a prosthetic valve. Uh, I think I know your answer, but I'm, I'd like to hear you state, and then I'd like to hear uh, Pat and Randy and uh, just comment also on, on that. So he's got severe mitral regurgitation? Yes, sorry, significant symptomatic severe MR, um, and, uh, but very elderly. Uh, so what are the advantages of repair in that type of a patient uh, as opposed to simply putting in a prosthetic valve? Well, if he's in generally good health uh, and, you know, we've got all these uh, rural communities around uh, Houston and we get many people in their 80s who are still out baling hay in the, in the fall, you know. And uh, so age, we've actually analyzed age is not a predictor of outcome in our experience. So in a healthy 85-year-old, uh, we would recommend uh, surgery. If he had any co significant comorbidities, we'd definitely uh, get Steve and uh, uh, Dr. Barker to uh, look at the patient with us. But if you, if you did operate him, if surgery was your pathway, um, my question is... Oh, always re repair. Re always repair. Uh, I really think we're very ignorant about uh, the, uh, the energetics of the function of the heart and the influence of uh, prosthetic uh, valves and repairs. And I've just given you a little taste of uh, what's out there, but I, I think we really need a lot more work. I mean, even with uh, valve replacement, there's a 20% depression of survival, which may not be that relevant in an 85-year-old, but uh, uh, there's definitely an impact on the heart. It, uh, it's such an efficient organ that when you take away 5 or 10% of its efficiency over a long time and a lot of beats, I really think that impacts left ventricular function. I think we've all seen these people we've operated on and they've done well. They've left the hospital with a normal EF and then 8, 10, 12 years later, they're back with an EF in the 20s and 30s for no obvious reason other than the fact they've got a prosthetic valve. So, uh, but of course... Uh, if they're not healthy, as many of them are, the, the uh, these non-invasive things have been a tremendous boon. We've sent a lot of people for the clip, and uh, we've had some really gratifying results, actually. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, that's part of the strength of our MitraClip program is the uh, the great relationship with surgery. Um, so it's when we we recently published as an experience of 12 patients clipping after surgery, um, and in general, if they have a ring, if they have a preserved posterior leaflet. Um, it, it's very easy to get a clip on there, and now you've sort of affected, you know, a very nice outcome. Um, if if the surgical center does a quadrangular resection of the posterior leaflet, it's much much harder, of course, because the tissue that you need to clip is gone. Um, so it's one of the advantages of a preserved posterior leaflet approach is that it gives you that option down the road to clip. Let me ask um, Jerry and Steve. So at what point do we need to do tricuspid valve repair at the time of primary mitral valve repair? Big debate about that. And I've, you know, I've, I've seen lots of patients that have had great mitral valve repairs 10, 12 years ago and come back with you know, AFib and then severe torrential massive white squirrel TR. <laughs> so at what point do we what point do we repair those? Do, do you do an annual size, Jerry? And do you, do you yeah, look at that? Uh, I think it's fair to say that the surgical community has uh, become a lot more aggressive, and I think there's some data to support it. So our sort of just rule of thumb, leaving everything else aside, is if the annulus is dilated to more than 40 millimeters and there's moderate TR, we always repair those. We just whip stitch that ring on it, and the tricuspid is extremely accessible surgically. It's, it's right there right. in front of you, right on the front of the heart, and it takes about 15 minutes to put a ring on. If the people are really critically ill and you've already done their aortic valve and their mitral valve, then you can do a bicuspidization. So that's still not a bad backup. But that doesn't have quite the durability. So you require four, you, you're at four centimeters and moderate TR. What about if yes. you've got and is that moderate before you're in the OR and on, on pump, or is it? It has to be before, okay. and we always get MRI on these people. If there's any doubt, MRI is our sort of main predictor. 
And on the MRI, we're also interested in their right ventricular volume. And again, the evidence is scanty, but uh, if someone's dilating up their right ventricle and it's got more than like a, an index of 100 to 150 uh, mils per meter squared, we tend to recommend surgery for them on that Dr. basis also. Dr. Pat. Yeah, I, I would just uh, uh, emphasize one of Dr. Lowry's points that this is a bone of contention in the surgical and cardiology environment <clears throat> currently. Certainly there are uh, surgeons like Dr. Adams who would not leave a tricuspid valve behind. And then there are surgeons like Dr. David in Toronto <laughs> who is less clear about his patients who might require a tricuspid valve repair. And he brought up an interesting point at the recent STS meeting with respect to uh, our um, uh, identification of this four centimeter tricuspid annular dimension, which is a, an echocardiographic modification of an intraoperative observation made by Dr. Dreyfus, where he actually measured with a ruler, I believe, uh, 70, seven centimeters. Yes. Um, and the, the extrapolation of seven centimeters in the operating room to four centimeters on an uh, apical four chamber uh, assessment is, has, has not really been validated. So suffice it to say. And, and um, may have been stretched even, you know, with that ruler, yeah, yeah. that almost bicuspidization. Yeah. So, I mean, what do we need data there? But I, I mean, that you are at a distinct disadvantage uh, not being able to look at the tricuspid valve, but I can assure you there's a big difference in the OR when you open up the right atrium and there's a dilated annulus that it's like that big or it's that big. I mean, that's very, yeah. that doesn't really change much. It may change a bit on the echo with load and everything. But. So my last point would be, I think, because there is equipoise in this area, this is the, the current um, half-completed trial in the CTSN network. And so we have a randomized prospective trial of repair versus no repair in patients with tricuspid regurgitation undergoing left heart surgery. And uh, the uh, equipoise is really around what to do with moderate TR without dilatation of the annulus and what to do with mild TR with dilatation of the annulus. And so we have actually randomized now more than 200 patients in a 400 patient trial. It'll be another three years before we know, but I think it's a reasonable question to ask. I think Certainly. everything you've said is true. The, when you get a fairly large volume of patients out there and you've left people with moderate TR, there, is a, there are enough of these people who come back that it really sort of messes up your day, having someone with a perfect mitral repair come back 18 months later symptomatic from uh, worsening right. TR. Yeah, I, I think it's really important for you all to remember that AFib is a big, big predictor of TR. So chronic, so a lot of these people with severe TR and the EP, you know, flip around in the EP world and then they're in the heart failure clinics and, you know, it's, it's a big issue. And so I think the trial and things like that are going to be very, very important. But I think, as, as Jerry mentioned, if, if you are a, have a very excellent surgeon and you've got moderate TR and you're doing a mitral valve repair and the annulus is approaching, it's 3.9 or 4, Pat, it's in that range, then a, then a, then a good repair done well, protecting the, pace, you know, the pacing system, is, is, looks pretty good in the long-term outcomes. We don't have randomized the, data yet. The other practical point is that people with significant TR, if they have any degree of left ventricular dysfunction preoperatively, it can be very difficult to manage post-op because you load them up, suddenly their CVP goes from 12 to 25, and you've got another whole set of problems, whereas when you fix the tricuspid valve, they become very simple to manage. So, Pat, Pat what about that first question up there? Well, just, just two, two more points, if I can. I think that um, there's, there's really no substitute for experience and wisdom, and we're grateful that uh, you, you can provide both, uh, number one, and I really mean that sincerely, I think, even when it comes to trying to predict perioperative risk. An experienced surgeon is a hell of a lot better than the STS score on a computer, I think. <laughs> Um, and secondly, um, we sometimes make assumptions about how safe various procedures are. And I just draw your attention to the uh, randomized trial that we did in atrial fibrillation ablation at time of mitral valve repair and discovered that there was a two-fold increase in the risk of permanent pacing in patients who underwent biatrial maze compared against those who did not have attempted ablation at time of mitral repair. So we're learning all sorts of things, uh, and it's a testimony, I think, to our surgeon colleagues who are willing to randomize uh, under these circumstances. So Pat, what about that first question? 
Well, this is an easy question, so I thought maybe Bill would answer it. <laughs> are, are you turfing? Bill, 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 I'm calling on the senator from Massachusetts to answer the question. Uh, exactly. <laughs> there, there's no turfing. <laughs> okay. So I think the, the answer to the question is I don't know. And I think it's fair to say that it's very difficult in individual patients to decide whether or not the mitral regurgitation is the major driver of symptoms at a various stage, at, at a relatively advanced stage in the natural history of a cardiomyopathic condition. I think you're obligated to do everything you can to treat those, those patients with guideline-directed medical therapy and device therapy, such as CRT when indicated, and then ask what's left over. Yes. And certainly if the mitral regurgitation remains severe and the patient is limited, and you have done everything you can, and you think in combination with your surgeons that they have the tickets to get through a relatively high-risk procedure, you would likely give them a chance at trying to improve their symptomatic status. And that's all about judgment, I think, at the end of the day. It's a typical class 2B situation in which we're involved. As Steve was pointing out, looking at torrential and even more torrential tricuspid regurgitation, these are the patients that we're seeing. So I think a lot of eyes on these folks, a lot of assessment in the non-invasive lab, t a treatment and then reassessment before making any decision. And the point that Pat made very importantly is remember, uh, this is a malapposition of the mitral valve. So medical therapy, synchronization in case needed, whatever it is, aggressive medical therapy, shrinking down the ventricle if you can, doing everything else. I mean, this mitral regurgitation is very dynamic. Now, in the extreme cases, you may not be able to affect it, but if you're optimizing heart failure therapy, not infrequently, you'll see some reduction of the mitral regurgitation. Let me go back to just quickly, because I'm, I'm curious what Jerry's thoughts and Deepan's short thoughts. Um, I've seen a, a, a several patients, and there's some very interesting literature from Christina Bassa and Gitano Theani in Padua, who are fabulous cardiac pathologists, on people, Jerry, with Barlow's, big time Barlow's, with migration of the posterior leaflet, who have lots of ventricular ectopy, in fact, have I might have episodes of VTAC and things like that, where they see on gadolinium MRI this patchy fibrosis under the posterior papillary muscle. And these, uh, there are, is a substrate of patients, women usually, with RV outflow tract type pathology who come in with sudden cardiac events. So have you seen those? And if you're operating on anybody like that, are you going to think about an ICD in those? So have you seen people who've come in with an arrest or a near arrest and have had bileaflet prolapse and have this type of morphology of, the, of scarring of the posterior, posterior wall? That was a very interesting question. Just on a historical note, when I first came to Houston, I was shocked to uh, hear that Dr. Cooley was young women were coming to him with chest pain and he felt it was due to torsion on, on the right. papillary muscle and he was putting mitral valve prostheses in these otherwise asymptomatic young women. So I guess in one sense he was ahead of the time recognizing what might be going on. We've actually had a, a great interest in this topic. Uh, we've not taken any, any uh, proactive steps uh, other than what we would do for any patient who had sudden cardiac arrest. Obviously if they've had the arrest right. then we'd, Obviously. we'd assess them for a defibrillator. But uh, Deepan might want to comment because we've had a number of studies going forward on our patients looking specifically at the question of fibrosis versus prognosis. Uh, and you definitely, when you operate on young people with mitral valve disease, they've got these nice reddish orange colored pictures, uh, papillary muscles like you see on all the illustrations. And in the older people, they become very fibrotic just as a matter of course. In the older people, they're very nice to stitch to. But Deepan may want to comment. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, no, that's a very interesting question. So that, we've actually been looking at this for the last few years now. Uh, at basically, patients that are coming in for assessment of mitral regurgitation, uh, and the, we've got the manuscript under review right now. But basically, it seems that it's in people who have prolapse as the etiology of their primary MR, there's a much higher prevalence of fibrosis in this infralateral wall compared to people who have primary MR due to other... You Talking know, about no. both fibroelastic and Barlow's? Yes, both. Okay. Yep. And, uh, and so we've got, again, the numbers are not huge, but it does seem to suggest that those people 
actually do have a worse outcome as well, just on observational assessment. The question, what do you do about that? Do you intervene early in these cases? We don't know the answer to yeah, that yet. Well, because we don't know what happens if you repair right. them. But this is a particular subset, most often women, most often young women, lots of ventriculectomy and big time borrowers type prolapse. And I, I don't know. Steve, do you have a, got any experience with that? Steve. Sorry. You're I was, Steve. I was reading these questions. I'm sorry. What were you saying? Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading what these questions were. That's OK. All right. Let me knock, let me knock these off, and we'll that, get to the break. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I can say is we've got 10 to 15 year follow-up in a reasonably large group of Barlow's, and uh, their prognosis seems to be, overall, as a group, seems to be similar to the regular okay. right. relapse patients. Let me hit these. So uh, first one, the tricuspid clip and uh, basically the diastolic inflow grading. Is that an issue? I didn't mention it explicitly, but the clip in the tricuspid position is used off-label. Um, and so we don't use it a ton in primary TR because really, as I mentioned, most of the TR we see is functional. So in functional TR, the RV is big, the leaflets, the annulus is big. You can put on one or two clips and you've sort of got a lot of area to reduce before you get into the, the range of uh, you know functional diastolic stenosis. So we've done, I think, six cases so far. Uh, it hasn't been an issue at all. Uh, there's really no significant impact on diastolic inflow. Uh, and that's because we're focused on functional TR. We have a case pending with somebody uh, with a flail leaflet. So we'll come back and we'll tell you later how that works out. The percutaneous tricuspid valve, uh, there are certainly advancements. Uh, they're not yet in humans. Um, the, the benefit on the tricuspid side, unlike the mitral side, is the RVOT is far away. So you really don't have any practical concerns about RVOT um, obstruction the way you do on the left side when you put in the new valve uh, in the tricuspid position. But the big problems are the, the local anatomy, the uh, coronary artery, um, the CS, uh, the AV node, uh, and the total lack of any calcification to help anchor a prosthesis. So lots of people are looking at it. Uh, there really isn't anything very uh, impressive so far. So I think for the moment, they're going to be uh, percutaneous repair techniques. And I think it'll be quite a long time until we see an actual implantable tricuspid valve. This question right here. Uh, this is a question for either Dippin or Steve. To assess the severity of the MR, if a patient present presence MR compatible device, either pacemaker or ICD, if you have the suboptimal transthoracic echo, is only left the TE be good enough to assess the severity of MR or is there any other alternative? Yes, yeah, so, um, so your question really gets to, can you do MRI imaging in patients with implanted devices, so pacemakers and defibrillators right. if that are a, not MRI if, conditional? Quote unquote. Yeah, so actually, to answer that question, um, there was a large uh, uh, study that called a MagnaSafe study, which we were involved with, which is 1,500 patients with non compatible uh, devices, 1,000 of which were pacemakers, and 500 of which were defibrillators. And in this large cohort, it was found that it's feasible to do it as long as you reprogram the device beforehand and afterwards. So at our, at our place now, since really since 2009, since we were involved in that registry, uh, we've been doing patients with these non-compatible devices uh, without any complications to date. Um, the key, obviously, is you need to screen to make sure there's not, uh, you know, the device is not near end of life, make sure that there's no abandoned leads. So there's a, there's a kind of very, very specific protocol by which we can do that. Uh, but as long as those criteria are met uh, and the patient's monitored throughout the procedure, uh, you know, that's no longer a contraindication here. All right, shall we uh, give them a break? How about that? Take a break, and thank you very much. <laughs>